Okay, students, this is the second video, second and final video on topic 9.3, Interference. And I'm going to talk about diffraction gratings, which is an extreme example of multiple slit diffraction. Okay, so you might want to review, if it's been a while since you saw the last video, you might want to review, especially the end of that, before you start this one. Okay, all right, it turns out that diffraction gratings, you need to know what is meant by the term diffraction gratings. And um, basically, this is... Um, this is a, a series of slits through which light passes uh, where there's a very, very, very large number, essentially almost infinite, okay? Uh, remember in the last video we talked about, we originally talked about a single slit, then we went to double slit, which is what Young did, and then I gave you examples of four slits, six slits, and the last one was 20 slits, okay? So imagine now that you have 40, up to 40,000 slits per centimeter, okay? Um, turns out that the physics is the same, and we saw that that the effect of um, having lots and lots of slits meant that that single diffraction pattern, okay, sort of spread out. You guys remember that, um, and that also obviously had to do with the with the um, with the slit width and the distance between the slits. Okay, so. Um, the reality is that diffraction gratings often, instead of having um, slits, they have lots of grooves cut in them. And I'll show you guys a couple of examples of that in class, okay? So the more slits, the sharper or brighter the pattern, and the more even the intensities of the fringes, okay? All right? So for a double slit, we had a graph, just to remind you guys, a double slit. Remember what that graph looked like? It was like this. Or no, sorry, a single slit was like that, right? Okay, so we had a we had that was the most extreme case. As we got more and more and more slits, um, we had that the intensity of all the maxima, the primary maxima, ended up being about the same. Okay, and that's what I mean when I say even the intensities of the fringes. And the sharper, brighter the pattern, meaning that sharper being that the width is smaller, which means that in practice you should be able to measure the distances between them a lot more easily. Okay. Okay, so here's a case where I have one, two, three, four, five different openings. We're talking about 40,000 per centimeter, okay, but the physics is the same, okay? Um, as usual, constructive interference creates the bright fringes, okay? Um, each fringe is located at an angle theta as before relative to the central fringe or an integer multiple of that, okay? So again, we had the central maximum, which was n equals zero, first order maximum, first order maximum on either side, n equals one. So um, the basic um, sort of diagram is still the same, okay, where theta is still that angle relative to the central fringe or that central line, okay? Okay, uh, but it's a little more complicated with the diffraction grading. So as before, I've labeled L1 and L2, okay? Um, and we said that, that L1 and L2, that path difference is important whether determining constructive or destructive interference. If that L1 minus L2 is equal to one half of a wavelength, we had, um, we, had, we had destructive interference. If it's equal to an integer multiple of the wavelength, we had constructive. In this particular diagram, okay, we have this little side, this little side here, this little length called little delta, okay? Here the path differences are L1 minus L2, and again, I'll put absolute value signs around it. That equals an integer uh, multiple of delta, okay? So we have delta, two delta, three delta, four delta, et cetera, okay? All right, so for constructive interference, that difference, which is N delta, has to be N times lambda, okay? All right, <clears throat> now diffraction gratings are rated, are sort of rated to have X lines per millimeter, okay? So what that means, this can be a little bit confusing with the units, okay? So for example, a common value would be 600 lines or you might see them written as rulings, right? 600 rulings per millimeter. What that means is that the actual spacing between those grooves, okay, is going to be 1 over x, 1 over 600, but in millimeters, okay? And you might want to pause the video and make sure that I have the right units here. So it's 1 over 600. That's going to be 1.67 times 10 to the minus 6 millimeters, right? Okay? Um, so that's really small, right? Make sure that you can do that basic mathematical equation there. So when we talk about diffraction gratings, we're going to concern ourselves not so much with destructive interference uh, um, initially, but just with constructive interference, okay? All right, so try this one on your own, okay? So we have a light of wavelength 680 nanometers falling normally, perpendicularly, on a diffraction grating that has 600 rulings per millimeter, which is the same number I just gave you in that previous slide. 
I want you to determine the angle between two maxima, which of course will be constant, and the number of maxima that can be observed. Okay? All right. The angle between the two maxima, well, I have to figure out the slit separation. This is the same uh, calculation that I did in the previous slide. It's right there. Okay? When n equals 1, okay, and this separation is constant for all fringes, so all I got to do is find one of them. When n equals 1, okay, um, I have that d sine theta equals n lambda. Okay, this is my equation that I'm working with. Okay, um, all I do is I solve for theta, and I get that theta is, and I'm just doing it in um, degrees, 24 degrees. So that means that in this diagram right here, right here, that distance would be 24 degrees. Okay, <clears throat> okay, and that's going to be the same between every single every single maximum. Okay, when the number of, the number of maxima that can be observed, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to test it for different values of n and see at what point my sine function blows up. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So I've already done one. I'm going to do n equals two, and I found that theta equals 54.5. <clears throat> okay. All right. When n equals three, okay. Um, I have that it's not possible because I have a sign that's greater than the number one, okay? So that's a little bit funky. That's not possible. So what that means is that no solution can be found for n greater than or equal to three. So therefore, only f uh, five bright fringes can be seen, okay? The central and two on either side. It's going to look something like this, although this diagram is not entirely accurate because they, we, they would all be of the same intensity, okay? Anyway. That's how you do it. Pretty interesting. Now, it turns out that diffraction gratings can be used to separate colors from white light, okay? And this is the most striking feature of diffraction gratings, and it's what makes them really cool when you look through them, okay? Um, so if I have a, a mixture of violet light and red light, okay, I'm giving you the, uh, the wavelengths, it falls on a diffraction grating that contains uh, 1 times 10 to the 4 lines per centimeter. For each wavelength, find the angle that locates the first order maxima. It's really interesting, okay? All right, so first thing I want to do is I want to find the separation between the grooves, and I find that it's 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters, okay? Um, for violet light, I find that theta is about 24 degrees, and again, here's my equation. I always write the equation off to the side so I know what, what I'm using because there's lots of different variables with all these light interference patterns, okay? So we have that theta equals 24 degrees for violet light, and for red light, it's 41 degrees, okay? Um, and since these two are not equal, um, <clears throat> we, we're going to see separate first-order fringes for each color. Does that make sense? And I'll show you in the next slide examples of what that looks like, okay? Essentially, what we'll end up with is a dispersion pattern of light, uh, not unlike what we see from a prism, okay? All right, so if sunlight or any other source of white light or any light that has more than two wavelengths in it, okay, if it's viewed through a diffraction grating, what you'll see is the angles for all the first order maxima range from 24, which was for violet, to 41, which was for red. And you'll have a rainbow, sort of a rainbow dispersion pattern on either side of n equals zero. The central maximum, however, this is so totally cool, is white because it's where all of them overlap there, okay? So there's, you would actually see nothing right here. You, well, nothing. You wouldn't see any colors there, okay? Higher order maxima can, of course, overlap. And so what you'd see, um, and we'll do this in class, is if you look at like a white light bulb, through a diffraction grating, check it out. It's so cool. You see, um, you see all these, um, all these different rainbow dispersions that are fanned out. Okay, if you, uh, surely you've noticed that on CDs and DVDs, you see the same thing. Those are in effect. Those behave as diffraction gratings, and that's something that we'll talk about um, a little bit later in this class. All right. So really cool stuff. This is real life. Um, this is real life stuff. It's you've seen it all the time. It's real life physics. Okay. All right. Now I want to talk about something that's maybe a little more difficult. This often gives um, students often have a trouble trouble with thin film interference, but I'm going to try to explain it to you in such a way that makes it. Uh, you're going to realize that you've actually already learned it. Okay. It's just an application of a couple of things. 
uh, a phase difference and refraction. That's really all it is, okay? So my first question to you, and of course the answer is yes, is that have you ever noticed the rainbow pattern of color on a bubble or thin film of oil on ground, okay? These are some of the most beautiful things in physics, right? Although this usually indicates that there's been some sort of environmental accident. Um, but anyway, the, um, the colors are actually really interesting and they're really cool. And of course, one thing that you notice is that you always have the same order of colors from red to violet, right? Okay? No matter what, okay? These are examples of what we call in physics of thin film interference, okay? And the central concepts to thin film interference are as follows. Number one, you have an extra distance which is covered by one of the rays when it's inside a thin translucent material. So you have to have a material through which a light ray can eventually pass, but one in which there is internal reflection. Okay, so you can see how this initial angle is going to make a difference, right? So we assume that we're not at that critical angle where the entire incident light ray is reflected. There's got to be some that's refracted within the actual thin film. And the thin film here, I should point out right now, which is given by a distance little d, that is the thickness of the soap bubble or the thickness of the layer of oil on the tarmac as shown in that first picture, okay? Okay, so central concepts. The first one is that extra distance, and the second is a phase change, okay? Uh, there's actually a phase change of um, pi when there's reflection at the top surface, okay? And that's because of the different indices of refraction between this material and that material. I'll talk about that um, right now, actually, okay? If we consider um, this to be a thin layer of oil, okay, so the first picture. If we let little d equal the thickness of the oil film, okay, the ray is incident from air, okay, this is air and this is oil. So at A, um, two things happen. There's a reflected light ray that goes that way, and there's a refracted light ray that goes to B, and that line segment AB shows the path, right? So the thicker d, the farther over to the right B would be right? Okay. All right. Now, you know that for air, the index of refraction is one, uh, or, or, or we treat it as one. For an oil film, remember everything has to, everything is always great, has a greater index of refraction than one. The more, um, the more opaque a substance, the greater that number. Okay. Here's my L1 and L2 again, um, labeled here. Okay. So at A, the reflected ray, which was what I'm calling L1, has a phase change of pi because it's bouncing off a surface with a higher index of refraction. Okay, the refracted ray reflects at B within the oil and comes back up. Now, because it's reflecting within a material that has a constant index of refraction, there's going to be no phase change there. Okay, so it's going to come from B to C. It's going to trace out that path as shown. And there's also some of it that's actually transmitted through the material, but we actually don't really care about what happens here. In fact, that gets sort of absorbed by the pavement or the tarmac underneath it. Okay, the point is that at C, once that, once that initially refracted ray bounces back up and gets to C, it emerges again. And because it's going from an object, uh, from a substance with a greater index of refraction to a lesser one, it will refract again away from the normal, resulting in L2. And what you end up with is you end up with two rays that are interfering with one another, coming out in this direction up here. Okay? All right. Now, if you remember uh, the diagram I showed you in the previous video, um, about uh, delta, right, and, and about multiple slits, okay, um, there's going to be interference and there's going to be a pattern because we have L1 and L2 and there's going to be a path length difference between them, which in this case is going to be equal to this distance right here as, as I'm showing, okay? All right, now again, if we assume that, okay, we're going to make a big assumption here and we're going to assume that the light is coming down normally on the surface, okay? So theta is approximately equal to zero, okay? If this is the case, then delta L is going to be equal to 2D. Do you see how that is? If you can imagine if this initial incident light ray is coming down more or less parallel uh, or perpendicular to the surface, um, it will be, these two rays will be very, very close together, right? But there will be a path difference between them, and that path difference is going to be 2 times D. Okay. All right. Now for constructive interference, we had the old condition. I'll put the absolute value signs there for you guys. Equals n lambda, which is d sine theta. But now the phase difference is pi. We have crest turned into troughs. Therefore, for constructive interference, what we're going to have is we're going to have that 
um, the difference in path length is going to be m plus one half times the wavelength of the oil, the wavelength inside the oil. Okay, which I've denoted by lambda oil. Okay, we have a new integer counter, and um, we're calling it m so as to differentiate it from n. Uh, which was our integer counter before, and confusingly, of course, the, the index of refraction also is denoted by little n. So please, please, please note that this n right up here, okay, is not the same n as the index of refraction, okay? Very, 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 very important, okay? So here are the conditions, all right? For constructive interference, we have that 2 times d times the index of refraction equals m plus 1 half times the wavelength. Okay, this is what's given to you in your IB data booklet. And these are assuming that there's one phase change. And we'll do some examples of this, so don't worry if you're not getting it initially. This is pretty complex stuff, okay? Um, destructive interference would be 2dn uh, equals m times lambda. So you can see that um, the main confusion probably for you with this topic is that the conditions for destructive and constructive interference appear to be opposite what they were before, right? Because remember we had the one-half wavelength difference for destructive and the, and the integer multiple of the wavelength difference for constructive before. It seems to be switched, right? Well, the reason why it's switched is because there's been a phase change. And that phase change has occurred with this first um, reflected incident light ray on top of the film. Okay? Um, now, if there are no or two phase changes, okay, then you would have the conditions as were more familiar for you before, okay? Um, this, this set of equations right here is not given to you. Only this will be given to you in your IB data booklet. So it's up to you to, um, to figure out how you're going to use these conditions for constructive and destructive interference. And you're going to have to think quite a bit before you do problem solving, but I'll, but I'll guide you through some problems, okay? So let's do a first example. So I have a thin soap bubble, and it has an index of refraction of 1.33, and it's viewed with a light of wavelength 550 nanometers. And that light appears to be very, very bright when you shine it on that bubble, meaning constructive interference. Predict the possible value of the thickness of the soap bubble. This is a classic IB type problem, okay? Now, in this case, I'm going to use conditions for constructive interference because they say very bright, okay? And here, as is almost always the case, I didn't mention this in the last slide, m is almost always equal to zero. It's kind of like... Um, you know, before we were always using n equals 1, right? Um, because we didn't really care about sort of quantifying the fringes that were that far out from the center. In this case, for problem solving in the IB, we're going to almost always assume that m equals 0, okay? Just to keep it simple, all right? This being the case, all we do is we solve for little d, okay? And again, n is not an integer counter. m is the index of refraction of the substance that the initial incident ray is going into and interacting with, okay? A possible value of the thickness is 103 nanometers. Now, why does it say a possible value? Because there could be lots of possible values. If you took m equal to 1, you would obviously get a different value. 2, 3, 4, 5, those are all possible values, okay? Okay? 